G'day. When one first studies statistics, meeting the null hypothesis in hypothesis testing can seem a little strange and unusual at first. It's basically, it basically has the feeling of a double negative. Let's assume nothing's going on and then reject that case to assume something is going on. It feels a little backward, it can be very confusing the first time you go through it. But it is actually the natural and appropriate way to study um, possible hypotheses and statistics. And I think the following example, be a little disturbing one, actually illustrates this point well. So here goes, here's, here's my disturbing example to illustrate why you want to work with a null hypothesis in statistics as the way to go about things. Here goes, a terrible disease is spreading across the country at some alarming rate. 50% of the people who get this disease recover on their own. Phew. Unfortunately, the remaining 50% of people will die. Two serums, A and B, have been developed in a mighty hurry, but there's been little time to test them, and the only data available about their effectiveness right now is the following. Of three patients with disease who were given serum A, all three survived. Seven out, of, seven out of eight patients with the disease who were given serum B survived. That's it. This is the only data about serums A and B. Now here's the puzzle. You have just discovered that you have the disease. Will you take serum A or will you take serum B? Uh, I guess most people answer that take both, but uh, let's assume that for some reason you can't take both. You've got to choose one or the other. Without them, you know you're going to um, you have a 50% chance of surviving. Now, which, so my question is, which option is better? Um, option one seems pretty good. I mean, of all the people that took serum A, all of them survived, but it's only three people. That's a very small uh, sample. Um, option B, serum B, actually has a, a bigger sample size, but not everyone survived with serum B. So the question is, which is actually better? Well, the way to nudge your way through this might be uh, to ask, okay, I've got the disease. I don't know if A and B having any serious effect at all. What, what could I go on? So let's ask, if A is having no effect whatsoever, what are the chances of me just naturally seeing three out of three people survive? Well, I can actually work that out. Uh, the chance of survival of each individual person is 50%, one half. So for three people to survive, person one, person two, person three, the chance of me seeing that naturally happen is person one survival, half a chance, Times half a chance of person's two survival, person's three survival, that is one eighth of a chance. There's a 12.5% chance I would see the result of three out of three people surviving if serum A was doing nothing. All right, let's do the same thing for serum B. What are the chances of me seeing seven out of eight, eight people survive if serum B is having no effect, it's just naturally happening? All right, well, it could be that person one survives, person two survives, blah, 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 up to person eight. The seven survives, but person eight dies. There's one option I could see that. Or maybe it's one through six survive, seven dies, eight survives. There's another way of seeing seven out of eight survive. In fact, I can see there's eight possible ways, you know, who's that eighth, who's that person that dies of, of in the scenario. So let's see. Chance of person one surviving times chance of person two surviving up the chance of person seven surviving plus the chance of person eight dying, also a half. This is dying. Or plus one survive, two survive, da, 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 six survive, seven die, eight survive. I'm basically going to see the same calculation eight times. So the chances of me seeing seven out of eight survive just naturally without serum B having any effect is eight times one over two to the uh, eight, which I believe is, okay, <laughs> oh, what's my percentage here? I could actually do some math. Do, 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 do. I can't even do math. So let's see, this was definitely 1 out of 32, I should say that at least. Um, and that's about 3.1%, I believe. All right, so, so see, as per usual, I can't actually do arithmetic. Um, so here we go. If A and B are having no effect, the chances of seeing the results of A naturally happen is 12.5%. The chances of seeing the results of B naturally happen with, that, with B having no effect is only 3%. It's pretty rare to see the effects that, that, that the second option has done. It's rarer than option A. So actually, I'm going to conclude that B is more likely to be having an effect than A is, given this data. It's producing an effect that is rarer for me to naturally see. So if I am this researcher who is given option, they're given these two options, I'm going to choose B. The chance of me seeing its results, if there's nothing going on, are rarer than the chances of me seeing A's results if nothing's going on. Therefore, it is more likely that A, that B is having some kind of effect. It's produced a more rarer, rarer rarely, more rarey <laughs> phenomenon than A. Therefore, I'm going to go with, with B. So that's it. 
that's sort of the basic structure behind this whole hypothesis something, is it hypothesis testing. Uh, just see how you would naturally see the results coming up on their own if nothing's going on. If they seem pretty rare, then you might conclude, hang on, maybe something is going on. There we go. That's it. All right, a brief little video. Hope that's been of help. Thanks so much.